Testing. Okay, today we're going to finish up our uh, foray into geometry by looking at some non-Euclidean geometry examples, uh, at least in number two, uh, Java applet. There will be some, uh, I'll assign some problems out of Boas and Zeller, uh, chapter 11, probably this Thursday. I think I may uh, give an extension to this limit homework in case people want to revise their solutions uh, after asking questions later on in this lecture. So what I'd like to do now is uh, give you an, a link to a Java version of a piece of software that has actually been used in the math education curriculum in our math program, the 360X sequence. It's called uh, Geometer Sketchpad. Now, I have not used this myself, but I've downloaded a few links and there is a web applet that allows you to download and use um, Sketchpad applications. So what this allows you to do is if you look at the source, pulling up the source here, This, um, all the geometry commands are contained in this parameter, which is an applet parameter. And you can tell that these are just ASCII commands that give you, for example, there's object number one at the point, object number two is a point, object number three is a point. Then it connects the triangle. These are just names. These are descriptions, vertices, et cetera. So what this gives you is a triangle and it's actually movable. There is a help link. If you click this, you'll get back to the blurb of, of the, the manufacturer here. The Geometer Sketchpad is a Windows and Macintosh product. It's put out by this particular site, KeyPress Curriculum. Now, there is an instructor's evaluation edition. There's also a demo edition that you can get. If you go back to the link, uh, download demo, you can download the Windows or the Macintosh version. Uh, to do the Windows version, it's Windows 3.10. And I've actually played around with a little bit. And there, uh, there are some scripts that have been written that illustrate non-Euclidean geometry, in particular hyperbolic geometry, that I actually have an applet that's uh, just as effective for that particular demonstration. If you want to learn how to write applications using their syntax here, I've included a link from their website which goes through the grammar of the applet and, and basically tells you everything you can construct lines and distances and interfaces, etc. So this tells you how to invoke the applet and how to actually get it to do various things. This is actually the example that I have, this particular one. So you can download the zip file, unzip it, and then get it on your website. The most complicated one is this construction parameter because it tells you pretty much all the various things that you can do with the applet here. And it's in the general format of an object name followed by argument followed by format. So line segment, three, one, six. So that's the option. So you have an object name called segment. The arguments are a list of points, three, comma, one, and the format, optional format in square brackets is thick. It tells you how to put comments and things. So uh, we might have a little uh, example of perhaps creating some geometry and having them calculate angles and things like that. So I'll play around with it a little bit to see how easy it is to write. Uh, so that will be uh, for a future reference. But I'd like to spend most of the time before we go over the um, first homework assignment, just general questions, is the section on non-Euclidean geometry. This is a, a really nice app that I was playing around with it before class. And this allows you to do classic rule and compass constructions 
in the hyperbolic geometry, the point, the punctured point cloud disk or the upper half plane. Now, if you click down on here and actually fire it off, this will bring up a pop-up applet. We'll go to this license and then let's uh, pause this for. Okay, when you resize the applet, you get a a universe. This is essentially an infinite dimensional space here because the distances become larger and larger as you approach the boundary. So if we just can draw a line segment, we just click the mouse on two points to construct the line segment joining them. So if I click from here to here, that is the line segment A and B. Now if you want to construct a infinite line, we'll do that. So to these two points, there is an infinite line. There is an infinite line. Here is an infinite line. And here is an infinite line. Now this is something that's very interesting. If you look at these two lines, these are lines that go out to infinity. Now, actually, this whole boundary of the edge is the point at infinity, so it's really not part of the, the plane, but it's sort of the, in, the, the, it's the boundary. If you look at these two lines, these do intersect at a point, so these are obviously not parallel. But if you consider this line, this line does not intersect this line. Now, if you have two, point, two lines in the Euclidean, our two plane that don't intersect, then they have to be parallel. So with that notion that lines that do not intersect in the plane are parallel, you have this line, CD, is parallel to IJ, and then it's also parallel to GH. So you have this very amusing fact that you have two lines that intersect, and there's a third line which is parallel to both which is a little unusual, right? Because normally if you have uh, <laughs> a line which is parallel to another, and if you have an intersection of one, then it would intersect the other, but that's not true in hyperbolic geometry. There are other things you can construct here. Uh, we can plot, we can draw line segments. So let's do that and we'll clear. Let's start off with a new one. Okay, so we can, we can construct uh, triangles. So, for example, if I have two points here, and then draw one here, that's that one uh, didn't work. Let's try that again. Delete. So draw a line segment between C and A. Now let's see if we can move this. So let's um, let's try it again here. <laughs> uh, okay, delete. Let's tr delete all of these guys here. I have a feeling I have a point. I want to show you how to calculate the angles in the hyperbolic plane. So let's draw a line segment between here and here and here and here. Now if we go into measurements, let's measure angles. So I'm going to click on three points where the middle point is the vertex. So if I click A, B, C, the angle is 44.1 degrees. That is, if you draw the tangent to this line and the tangent to this line, then at the neighborhood of this point, it makes a 44 degree angle. And it looks almost like a 45 degree angle. Now, suppose I do D, C, and A, 35.6, and C, A, D. Now, if you look at the sum of these, if you had a triangle in the plane, it's a theorem that the interior angles have to add up to pi, 180 degrees. But clearly, 
If you add these up, 25, 35.6, that's 60.6 degrees, and that's 44, you get 104.7 degrees as the sum of the interior angles of this triangle. So suppose if I draw a line segment between C and A, you can see that obviously these are less than the line segments connecting them, and that's, that's a theorem that the hyperbolic angles add up to less than pi, and it's clearly shown here. Now, there are other measurements that you can do. You can measure a triangle. I'm not exactly sure how that one works. Oh, click the mouse on any three points. So there's my mouse is misbehaving one. So I have to highlight two, three. Okay, so triangle C O D. So we have the lengths and the sums, and the interior angle sum is 104.7. Now, if you make a very large triangle, let's draw line segment way up here, over here, oops, you don't want to do that. Delete that line segment. This is a little clumsy with my particular mouse here. Let's try this again. So we're going to draw a line segment between this point, this point, this point, and that point, that point, and that point. Now let's do the measurement of the triangle on these three points. One, two, three. The interior angle adds up to 104 point, right now, Actually, 9.7 degrees. <laughs> so we have a triangle. Each of these is, are, there's so much of a cusp there that the angle is actually very close to zero. If that point were at infinity, uh, it would actually be arbitrarily close to zero. Okay, so this is a graphic uh, demonstration that in non-Euclidean geometry, if you were an ant that lived here, on this world, and you are measuring distances and geodesics by this procedure, it would be a very strange world to live in. Now, there's also a number of uh, sites, links on this site, that I won't go through completely, but it, it's a very nice, uh, they give you a tutorial to start out, so they explain how to use this Java Alpha to draw your first triangle, and that's basically what we've done. You can also look at a link here on getting getting started, drawing angles, general angles. For example, under isosceles triangle, you have a Euclidean geometry, and isosceles triangle is a triangle that has two sides of the same length. And there are some theorems about isosceles triangles and angles opposite equal sides, etc. And then the question is, is which of any of those are theorems are true in hyperbolic geometry? And then they have activities for equilateral triangles, and some of these may appear on our, our homework here. Tessellations of the plane is a little bit more advanced than what we have here. So that's a good way to get started exploring the world of non-Euclidean geometry. Uh, there are also a lot of really nice links here. This is a good discussion about what non-Euclidean geometry is. The origins that we talked about are from Euclid himself in 300 or 270 BC, and Euclid's elements was a standard fare 
up until the mid-1900s. So over 2,000 years, they were basically teaching the same material. There are two alternate non-Euclidean geometries. One is spherical geometry, and the other is Euclidean geometry. And these were developed by Lebicheski and uh, another fellow. So you can link through here. Um, this fellow who wrote this guy was actually a graduate student, was formerly at Rice and is now at University of New Mexico. There is, as we know, some deep links between Einstein's general theory of relativity and the curvature of space, measuring distance, the metric, the Riemannian metric, and our notions of straight lines and geometry. There is an example here uh, talking about a very dramatic demonstration of Einstein's theory. I believe we discussed it earlier that looking at the orbit of Mercury, there's a small deviation in the orbit of Mercury because of the, the presence of the, the sun's gravitational field bending space uh, in that. So not only are light rays bent dramatically by the sun, but also uh, the local curvature of the space is strong enough near Mercury to actually cause its orbit to wobble in a very definite way. Uh, we are unfortunately a little bit too far away from the sun for any of our instruments to measure uh, the deviations in the orbit of the Earth. There is also a description of the pseudosphere and discussion of what constitutes parallel lines. And this was an example we just did. Two, two lines cannot meet, but a third line can intersect one of the parallel lines but not the other, which is very odd in two dimensions. Now you have to get over uh, the idea of parallel, meaning like train tracks. It's not doesn't mean that. Parallel just means that two lines go out to infinity in the plane and do not intersect. And in the hyperbolic, there are just lots and lots of non-intersecting hyperbolic lines. You have abundance of them. Uh, calculating areas in hyperbolic geometry, that's very interesting. And you need some properties to actually calculate the area. Here's an interesting link that you can explore is how to set up a set of mutual, or these I guess are not mutually orthogonal, but they are a set of uh, curvilinear coordinates that allow you to calculate vert with respect to the origin any point P in terms of these coordinate systems. So it's this hyperbolic coordinate geometry. And in terms of that, you can calculate curves and areas and angles, etc. It talks about two half models for this non Euclidean, the disk in the upper half plane, and then there's a little blurb on why it's important for students to study non-Euclidean geometry, in part not because it's easy, but because it, it develops your understanding of axiomatic systems. So this is actually, uh, amazingly enough, the MTTM uh, guideline calls for comparing Euclidean and non-Euclidean geometries in high school. Uh, for those who wish to go to college, so that's uh, a challenging task. Then there's a, a whole lot of references and further reading. Flatland is a, a very interesting and funny book. It was written in 1884 to, to try to get across to people the peculiarities of living in a two-dimensional world. It's a, it's a very amusing little book. It's, it's, it's brief, but highly entertaining. So I'd encourage you to go through and visit this website. Um, I think what we'll do now is uh, turn to a general discussion of some of the issues that were in homework assignment number four and, and talk about those for a little bit. So what I think I'll do now is in this particular part of the lecture, and start uh, addressing some of the issues that may be residual from the next uh, from the from homework assignment four.
Okay, here is the HTML version of homework assignment four. So I guess we'll just go through and resolve any last minute uh, uncertainties regarding any of these particular problems. Are there any questions then on the first one? Okay, so just ask the question and I'll rephrase it for the distant student. Okay, so the question is, is how to turn the geometric hints into an actual epsilon delta proof. So what you need in that is the identity for, if you look at, um, and this is where it follows from, if you look at the graphs of sine and tangent, so the sine function goes off like this. And if you draw a, let's do it in red here, if you draw a line that goes through this, if, if this is the function x, and this is sine of x, then you of course have the identity that sine of x is less than or equal to x for all values of x, which says that sine of x over x is actually strictly less than 1 if x is not 0. Okay, so the only place that these are actually tangent is at the origin. So you have this inequality here. You also have, if you look at the tangent, that looks like this. and look at this line here, that the tangent lies above the x value. So x is actually less than or equal to the tangent of x in absolute value. So you've got these two identities. Now if you take away the absolute value, and this says what, that x is sine of a cosine, right? So this says we divide through by so x that sine x over x is bigger than cosine. So if you combine these, you get the cosine of x is less than sine x over x, and that's less than 1. Now this is actually true without the absolute values, and that's what's important. So in fact, you can write cosine of x is less than sine x over x is less than 1 for x not 0 and x near 0. So x, for x small, this set of inequalities is actually true. Now if you subtract 1 from this, this is less than sine x over x minus 1 is less than 0. Now, because this is negative, we can take absolute values. And when you take absolute values, this is more negative, so that it's reversed. So we're finally led to this very important identity. Okay. Why may I do this? Well, Okay, let me show you why that is in, in slow motion here. Okay, so why is this uh, true? Let me make that. How does it follow? Well, let's go uh, to the next page here and ask if you have, suppose you have um, A is less than B, is less than zero. If you, if you look at this in a number line, this says, okay, here's B, and here's A. Now, obviously, the absolute value of A is bigger than the absolute value of B. It's bigger than zero. So when you have numbers which are negative in this relationship, the absolute values are reversed, because in magnitude, the more negative it is, in magnitude, it's larger. Okay. That is a key. 
So now you have this inequality. The thing that you're trying to estimate is, now, when x is near 0, cosine is near 1, so this quantity is small. And how small is it? Well, this is, this is the other key thing, is you now have to estimate 1 minus cosine x in terms of something involving x. And the claim is, you can actually show that. And I'll let you, this, this follows for some trigonometric manipulation, which I won't do because then otherwise I'll solve the entire problem. But once you have that, combining this with sine of x over x minus 1, you're basically done because this is f of x minus l less than, you want this to be epsilon, but this involves delta. So any time you have f of x minus l less than some function of delta, all you have to do is make that function of delta less than epsilon, and you're done. This relationship tells you how small delta has to be to make f of x minus l less than epsilon. So that's all you need. So this key identity here, along with this and this inequality, all uh, you need to basically turn the geometrical inequality. Now, this is, I gave you sort of a graphical reason, and some of you have also found out that there's a geometrical reason why those angle inequalities are true. Namely, if you have a unit circle like this with r equals 1 and this is theta, then this angle s is equal to r theta. This angle here, which is y and x, y is equal, to y over 1 is sine theta x is equal to cosine theta. And you can get the relationship between sine theta and theta. Since r is 1, this is just equal to theta. And it's obvious that this distance, y, is less than the arc length, s. So y less than s is the same as saying sine theta is less than theta. And the other angle you can get from an area argument. So there's a geometrical justification as well as. So that's pretty much how you get, putting those together gives you the link to go from geometry to an epsilon delta. Um, this one, number two, is there another question? So number two, uh, basically, I won't give you too much detail on this. You just have to write sine of the sine of x as the product of two limits, both of which are of this form. Now, let me just go through the uh, brief methodology that how you show a limit does not exist. Now, the hint is uh, you want to show that you can get two inequalities that are incompatible. So, how do you show that a limit doesn't exist? And that's a question. So how does one show when that does not exist? Well, usually if you show something does not exist, what you do is you do proof by contradiction. But what that means is you assume it does exist, you show that it leads to a contradiction, therefore the limit cannot exist. So you assume the limit exists. You derive a contradiction. And basically, because in logic, truth cannot imply false, therefore the limit cannot exist.
Okay, so how would you, you get arrive at a contradiction? Well, you assume that the limit exists. So if the limit of the sine 1 over x existed, you could find an L. So this is true. Let me clean up that a little bit here. So we would assume that if the limit were L, if the limit exists and equal to L, then this would be true. That means what? That you can find there's a delta so that x less than delta, x minus zero less than delta, implies that sine one over x minus L is less than epsilon. Okay, <clears throat> so we're going to pick an epsilon small. So we're going to pick epsilon, say, less than one-half. Now we're going to try to find a delta. So assume there's a delta exists. Well, the problem is, is no matter how small the delta that you exist, this function oscillates. So I can pick an x1 that, say, is equal to 1 over um, n pi. I can make that as small as I want. Sine of 1 over x1 is, of course, sine of n pi. So that's 0. So I found a value so that this is 0. And if I pick another value, suppose that's um, I let me make this 2. It doesn't really matter. So then this is 2n plus a half pi. Then sine of 1 over that is sine of 2n plus 1 half pi, which is equal to what? Sine pi over 2, which is 1. So I have a value where sine is 0 and 1. So I have now two values. In any given any delta, I can find points so that this is true. But then these two together is a contradiction. Let's see. That's the symbol for contradiction there. So this is really two arguments in a row. You assume that the limit exists. If the limit exists, there has to be some number L. If, it's, if it exists, then given delta epsilon positive, there's a delta. So it's sine 1 of x minus L is within epsilon of L. That's really hard to do because, as you know, this oscillates infinitely often. What that means is you can always find two points arbitrarily small so that this inequality is violated. Now, if you can never find a delta so that this inequality is true, and that's what we're proving down here, that means you cannot find a delta so that this was less than epsilon. That means the limit, that means that such an L basically doesn't exist because you end up having an inequality that can't simultaneously hold in a region about the origin. Now, graphically, what's happening here is you just look at the curve, right? What does sine 1 over x look like? Well, it, it oscillates just infinitely often. It just sits in this, you know, near the origin. It looks like this. And then from the other side, it just oscillates more and more. So no matter what tiny interval you go to, minus delta to delta here, there's essentially oscillates between plus 1 and minus 1. So you can always find points which give you a contradiction. So that shows you pretty much the, the kind of, you have to provide the details, but that's how you do it. There was a question on this asymptotic relationship for the Fibonacci numbers. 
And how you do asymptotics of any sequence is the following. If you note, for example, if you have, um, say, 2 times 3 to the n plus 4 times 5 to the n, if this was your a to the n, it's very easy to get the asymptotics of this because I claim that a sub n is asymptotically 4 times 5 to the n. In other words, it's the dominant exponential term, the term that grows most rapidly. Because if I took a n over 4 times 5 to the n, what do I get? I get 2 times 3 to the n, 4 times 5 to the n, divided by 4 times 5 to the n. It's clear that these cancel to give you 1. And then this term is 2 times 3 to the n over 4 times 5 to the n. This gives you a constant, which is 1 half. But this gives you 3 fifths raised to the n, which does what? Goes to 0. So this is a term that looks like 1 plus something that's going to 0. And that's exactly what this asymptotics means. That a n divided by c r to n equals 1. So all you have to do is pick out the term which basically dominates the other term, and simple algebra will tell you that that's in fact the asymptotic expression. OK, so the, uh, the correct asymptotics follows from the correct recursion relationship. It's rather odd that this uh, sum of powers of irrational numbers should always be an integer, but that's just the way that cancellation works. Uh, number six, the hint there is that we've got to know something about a Taylor series, and the Taylor series for inverse tangent of x is uh, pretty clear. So remember what the tangent is, the arc tangent in terms of an integral is what? It's the integral of 1 over 1 plus x squared dx, right? That's the antiderivative tangent of x. So 1 over 1 plus delta, the geometric series says that this is 1 minus delta plus delta squared minus delta cubed, etc. And the, the companion series if you use r, it would be 1 plus r plus r squared, et cetera. These are series that you really have to pretty much immediately recognize and identify. These are geometric series. And it's a theorem that if you have an absolutely convergent geometric series, then you can integrate it and differentiate it, and it will still converge uh, within its radius of convergence. So. If you know the series for 1 plus x squared, which you can find from these down here, you can integrate it and get the Taylor series for a tangent of x. Or you could just calculate a whole bunch of derivatives or slam it into maple. And a couple of ways you can do number 7. Probably, this is not the most intuitive way, but it's the most direct way and doesn't require what you know about integral comparison tests. If you want to do uh, kind of a slick way, uh, let me just point out why it is that the harmonic series n equals 1 to infinity diverges. Because if you graph 1 over x between 1 and infinity, you can do a Riemann sum approximation. And let's see, uh, we want to bound this bigger than an integral. So, OK, so if I do a, a series from 1 to 2 here, this is a height 1. Now, this is at height 1 half. This is height 1 third, et cetera. So this area is 1. This area is 1 half. This area is one third. So this is actually, well, if I do a finite sum down to capital N, this is bigger than 
1 over n from n equals 1 to n is bigger than the integral from 1 to n of 1 over x dx, which is the natural log of x between 1 and n, which is the natural log of n. So that says that if you sum up this harmonic series from 1 to n, it's bigger than log n. But log n, as n gets large, becomes infinite, although very slowly. For example, if you took uh, 10 to the 100 terms, what's the natural log of that? It would be 100 times the natural log of 10. The natural log of 10 is, I think, less than 3. So this is less than 300. So if you took one Google, and I mean 10 followed by 100 zeros is a heck of a lot of terms. If you added that many terms, this infinite series would only would still sum to something less than 300. This is pretty slowly divergent. It is divergent, but it's very slow. This is what's known as an integral comparison test. And this is one way uh, to show that the harmonic series diverges. And you can clearly relate the harmonic series to this series by direct comparison. Another way is just to group terms, right? Suppose you have a term this term. So suppose you have 1 tenth, 1 eleventh, 1 twelfth, etc., and you add up 1 one hundred. I claim you can estimate that very simply as it's bigger than the smallest term times the number of terms. Now, this gives you 101 terms. Right? No, 91, sorry. This gives you 91 terms. So this is certainly bigger than 9 tenths. So if I add up all the reciprocals of the integers from 1 tenth to 1 hundredth, I would get something that's bigger than 9 tenths. So you can always estimate, as a lower bound, a series of positive terms by the number of terms, n terms, times the minimum. Okay? That's a trivial observation. Now, if you look at this, you can estimate what the smallest term is. You can count up the number of terms, and you can show that directly it's bigger than that. So obviously, if you group together an infinite series into an infinite number of pieces, each of which is bigger than a positive number, but does not go to zero, it obviously diverges just by direct computation. The Archimedes and the numerical analyst, there was an error in this uh, original link, and the error is uh, down in the part down here where it says that where it says that capital P of T n is the harmonic mean of P n and little P n. That's actually not correct. If you look at the other reference, PDF reference, it gives you a correct statement. It will be coming up in just a second. I think it's in section 1.31. Let's expand this a little bit. And keep on. Okay, here it is. This gives you L and little l are capital P and little p. And let's see. And here is the recursion relation here. <coughs> A is 
Okay, AM and BMB, the circumscribed and inscribed. So AM is the outer and BM is the inner. So this is the relationship here. It's actually, this is the harmonic mean and this is harmonic mean and this is the geometric mean. So um, if you get the correct relationship, then you can uh, go through the limit. Also, you need to know about uh, Richard's extrapolation. And Richard's extrapolation is a very easy concept. And that is, if you have two expressions, suppose you have little piece of n was equal to, say, 2 pi plus something that looks like 1 over n squared. That means it's 2 pi plus a constant over n squared plus some other terms. If you look at P2n, that's the same expansion, 2 pi, except that it's 2n squared plus terms, which is 2 pi plus c1 over 4n squared. So basically, if you multiply this expression times 4, you will get 8 pi plus c1 over n squared plus some other terms. And if you subtract pn, which is 2 pi plus c1 over n squared, you can see exactly what happens. For capital P2n minus Pn will be 8 pi minus that, which is 6 pi. And these will actually cancel. And you end up with something which is then over n to the fourth, or at least the power that's n cubed the greater. So therefore, if I divide this by 3, over 3, I get my original estimate 2 pi plus a term which decays more rapidly than n squared. So you can bootstrap this process up because now you can redefine these, say, as q to the n, and then q to the n has a 1 over n to the fourth. You can take appropriate combinations of q to the n and n to the n to the sixth or n to the eighth, however any. So that's, in a nutshell, what Richardson extrapolation is. The heavy side function, that's really number three all over again. And this one, uh, the hint is to use L'Hopital's rule with this expression. So that should probably give you uh, enough hints to redo the homework if necessary. Also, I think I will post the complete solutions on the web either in the form of a video or a PDF file. Uh,